be. So I'd like to thank everyone for joining us for session eight of our weekly COVID webinar series. Also, thanks to all of you that made sure we knew that it was a state holiday. I know there was a little concern if we were going to have the webinar or not, but no, the show must go on. And I don't think I can introduce Val any more than that. So Val, it's all you. Thank you, Heike, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, it has finally quit raining here in Jefferson City this morning and the sun is out and I'm trying to decide if I'm gonna cover my plants tonight or not. Am I gonna risk it with the frost or if I'm not gonna risk it with the frost? But we'll see, we'll see. Um, I just kinda wanted to bring in a little of the personal on this today because I know people are starting to really, really struggle with, um, and, and this is kinda how I look at it. You feel selfish and you feel guilty when you're not just talking about COVID all the time, but you're kind of sad because you're starting to miss out on some things. And so for me personally today, it would be a day that I would be doing field day with my kids at their school. We're not doing that because we don't have school. Wednesday, my son would have gone to the city museum in St. Louis for his field trip. He did not get to do that because we don't have school. And he also got notified this week that one of his summer camps is canceled now. And so, this is really personal and people, it's okay to feel sad and it's okay to feel mad because things are getting taken away from us and it's, and it's really hard to understand why. But I will tell you, as we look at these numbers, we have to continue to stay vigilant. And that kind of brings me to the second thing I wanted to talk through, which was one of the questions that we've gotten. Um, one of the questions we got is, are DMHDD contracted residential service settings to follow the CDC guidance pertaining to COVID-19 for long-term care facilities? If so, why? And I will tell you, if you're in a congregate facility, if you're serving more than five people, I strongly suggest that you follow those guidelines. However, and I will tell you that in our um, ICF facilities, we will continue to follow those guidelines. And it pains me not to allow visitors in there. It pains me to no end. But there's still so much we don't understand about this virus. And But the one thing we do know because we're living it is it's highly contagious and it has, um, and it can have extremely negative impacts on the people that we support. And so we keep remembering that as we're thinking about how we re-enter. With that said, we also have Southwest Community Supports that the state operates in Nevada, Missouri. That's where our HAB Center used to be and we've successfully transitioned everybody that was down there into the community. And we've got great relationships in our community and that Nevada area and the surrounding counties have seen very low new cases in the last seven and, or, and no new, or very low new cases in the last 14, no new cases in the last seven days. So we're starting to try to work with those individuals and those individual households to figure out how can you re-enter, um, re-enter the community. And that's why those individual planning guides are so important. But I also don't want people to forget that your, if, if you're a family member who is trying to figure out how I can visit my loved one in an ISL, if you're an individual in an ISL who's trying to understand if now's the right time for your roommate to move back in, if you're staff or a provider and you're trying to figure out, do we say yes to this or do we not say yes to this? I mean, I'm just gonna kind of go through how we're thinking about it. So on the individual side and the family visiting side, I, you know, if you're coming from St. Louis and Kansas City right now, I would have a real, Buchanan County, I would have, I would really struggle with saying, it's okay for, for you to come in and visit. Um, we're gonna have to really try to figure out how we can allow that face-to-face -face contact to happen without jeopardizing anybody else in those homes. That includes residents and that includes the staff because they're very, very important. So, you know, yeah, if you live in Nevada, probably okay. If you're coming from St. Louis to visit your loved one in Nevada, I'm not sure how I feel about that right now, just based on what we know about the numbers in St. Louis. Um, as far as masks, you know, can an individual go out into the community that lives in the ISL? Can they go to Walmart? Can they go to the grocery store? You know, the CDC still recommends that people wear masks if they're gonna be in places that they cannot be socially distant. So there's the fact that are you in a place that you can't socially distance? And are you yourself somebody who's not gonna be successful socially distancing? And so those are the things you've gotta think about, but there's no blanket answer to any of this. And I, and I know that's hard because you really just want me to say, go on May 15th, but I can't tell you that. 
it really, it's really, and that's the great thing about our system. We have built this individually supported system that is driven by what people need and what their desires are and what their dreams are and what their wants are. And because of that, we have to really think through now um, your impact on your roommate, your impact on your staff, your impact on your community. And we just really need to, people to, to learn about the data and to be, and just to accept that, you know, maybe I don't get to go visit my loved one, but the good news is, is that um, my roommate's mom who lives in that same town is gonna be able to go in there and I can talk to her maybe too. I mean, just think you still have to continue to be creative, but that's kind of some of the stuff that we're thinking about when we're thinking about what happens with our ISL type arrangements that are operated by the state right now. Um, but, you know, it's, it's tricky. It's very, very tricky. And I just, please, the best thing you can do for yourself is just try to make, go to the CDC website, go to the Department of Health website and really try to enter, and we continue to push those resources out, but really try to understand why it's important to wear a mask. Mask protect you, mask protect other people from you is what a mask does. And so that's important. Um, and just also, I mean, we are seeing more folks in, in the community that live in our ISLs right now. We were really, really, really fortunate for a long time to not have a lot of a lot of cases, and we still don't have a lot of cases. But we have more now, and we are now seeing those pop up daily instead of weekly. So just remember that that um, you know exposure is exposure, and it's it's really, really difficult um, to to. Uh, to limit exposure to this, I'm not gonna lie. Another question we got, which kind of feeds into this, so we'll go through that, is are direct support professionals considered healthcare personnel when applying CDC guidance pertaining to COVID-19? If so, why? And I will tell you why we say so. Um, we say so because we support individuals' activities of daily living, and we do so a lot of times in an environment where you cannot do social distancing. And we do so, um, we are also affecting people, we're, we're giving people their medications, we're helping people bathe, we're helping them brush their teeth, we're making sure that they can eat, which could maybe sometimes include feeding them. So when you're that intimately involved with somebody's activities of daily living, you look more like a healthcare provider than you do a barber or a meat processing plant worker or those kind of things. So you got to think about what you're doing whenever you try to figure out how to categorize yourself as an employee. Um, so that's just kind of walking again through as we go through these reentry things, the, thing, the way that we're thinking about it, the things that we're thinking about, and just, again, I cannot emphasize enough the importance of thinking about this at the individual level, at um, your personal home level, amongst your staff, you just keep building up. And until you feel comfortable answering all those questions for everybody, that you, the, the risks are still there, everybody, and I want to make sure people understand that. Um, so let's change direction and let's talk about the budget. Um, not that this is a good direction to go to right now, but um, today in the newspaper, and you guys know this, I get the newspaper every day. Today in the newspaper, the headline on the front page was budget director says no one expected the, the impact on the economy to be like this. And I, I can't emphasize enough. We don't know when things are gonna change. We don't know. Um, what the impact of, of limited reentry is, um, more expanded reentry is on, on even consumers' um, willingness to go out and spend money and do things. So you got to think about uh, you may reenter, but if no one shows up to your store because they're still concerned about what's going on in their community, um, reopening your store really didn't do do much. So uh, those are just, there's a lot of unknowns on the revenue side of the state. And we spend a lot of time talking about revenue because it's important when you get in times like this to understand that those unknowns mean we don't know a lot about what's gonna happen with our budget. I will tell you what the House and Senate did. They actually closed conference out on, our, on the Department of Mental Health and the division's budget last night. So we did get some funding for our wait list. That does not mean we will not continue to have a wait list. We did not get all of the funding we had requested for our wait list. We did not get funding for provider rate increases, which we know are very important uh, because we've got a workforce that we support that needs to be paid appropriately. Um, we did get some funding from the Coronavirus Relief Fund. Uh, that we could use to help support providers, but that's a decision that gets made at a higher level. 
having the authority in your budget to spend and actually getting to spend it are two different things when you're talking about that kind of funding. But we are gonna to start to work with some folks to try to develop a plan for how, what we think that funding should be utilized for and put some numbers to that. Gary's really excited. He's taking notes about his next project. He's, he's pretty pumped. Yep. Um, so that is kind of the budget update in a nutshell. Those were our two big things that we were working on. Not a lot of cuts came out of the budget for us right now, so that's really good. That kind of keeps us at a status quo level, which is where we would like to see ourselves at, especially with revenues being so uncertain at this time. However, as somebody, and I've said this before, but I will say it again, as somebody who used to work in that budget office, they're not, well, I'm not gonna know what our budget is until June when, when that actually gets announced. And then it, it could change in October and it could change in December. I've, I've worked in all of those environments before. So um, just know we'll do our best to keep you updated. Right now, things look status quo-y, which is better than decreases and planning for decreases. So we're, we're grateful for that. Um, another thing that we're going to do, and you'll notice this on kind of a lot of different fronts, we're going to change our email blast communication. We've been doing that daily since, I can't even tell you, March. middle of March. We're going to move that to Monday, Wednesday, and Friday now. Um, if, if we think there's something that needs to be blasted more sooner than Monday, Wednesday, or Friday, we will do a daily blast. But if you don't see a blast on Tuesday and Thursday, don't be alarmed. You're still on the listserv. We are just changing the cadence to Monday, Wednesday, and Friday for that. Um, so that's enough on that side. Let's talk about fun stuff. So, you know, we do have some of the coolest providers and we support some of the coolest individuals in the state. And we've been working on empowering for employment since, oh my goodness, 2000, I'm looking at the map over here, 2016. So it's 2020 now, and we're excited to announce that Oregon County has achieved purple status, which means 35% of the folks that Oregon County supports with um, uh, through case management and are in the waiver have an employment uh, service on their, uh, for themselves. So we're very excited about that um, because we love to see people working. We actually had an increase in five regions and statewide increase from last month. This is our second largest monthly increase since we started doing this. So people are really getting to spend some time talking about um, employment, which is great. Boone County is only one person away from achieving a red ribbon status. Uh, Howard County is only five people away from achieving purple ribbon. Henry County is only one person away from achieving red ribbon. And Livingston County is two people away from blue. If we get Livingston County to blue, um, we can get three fourths of the Kirksville TCMs. We'll have at Kirksville Region TCMs will have at least a blue status. So way to go, everybody! Uh, congratulations to your case managers um, and your supervisors and your executive directors and your employment providers out there because I know it takes all of those folks to really, really push how important employment is and how valuable it is in the individuals that we support lives. Then we have some frontline hero stories, so we're going to share some of those today. All of us are. Um, we have got, I am impressed at the number of frontline heroes on our website, and we have reported that all the way up to the governor, and they're excited to see these frontline hero stories. So please keep posting those. Um, those and our, uh, what's the other thing called? Stories from the field. Stories from the field. Both of those have gone all the way to the governor's office as ways that we're communicating and learning about the good and the bad things that are going out in, in our community. So. Uh, frontline hero, Kiera and Sheila, both work in Kansas City. They've been supporting an individual who had to move into a hotel at the beginning of April when others in her home started testing positive for COVID. So this individual was isolated to prevent her from getting sick, and Sheila and Kiera became her two staff. So they are the ones that took care of her and are continuing to take care of her, I believe. Mm -hmm. They've gone above and beyond to help this individual to make this unique time and enjoyable experience for her. This individual loves her new staff and has enjoyed singing along to American Idol with them, enjoying her favorite treats and snacks, getting pampered, and having one-on-one -on -one girl time with them. The two staff have also done an excellent job of communicating with the individual's guardian who lives out of state, and they send pictures and help facilitate FaceTime calls. They've made this challenging situation enjoyable for this individual, and they are doing a great job. And I know we have lots of those stories, so please, as we tell you these stories, you're like, I got that. Send them in to us. We will, I, will, I want to like go to page two on the webpage. That's, that's how many of these I want. 
Etta E. works in Higginsville, and Etta's been making masks for anyone who needs them. She buys all the material herself and does not charge anyone who would like a mask. She volunteers to work overtime without complaints, and she tries to work three to four times a week. So thank you, Etta, and thank you for whoever put that story in. I know I, once we've got a lot of masks out, we wear masks here in central office, and um, I'm so grateful that someone made me one of those masks because I might have broken my sewing machine trying to make one as I look at it. <laughs> so thank you very much. And then Joelle C. works in St. Louis. Joelle's always a team player. She took on the task of sewing masks for the entire facility. Joelle works with a smile and a lot of energy. You don't have to ask. She's already on it. Joelle is definitely a hero and appreciated. And I know we have a lot of regional office folks here with DMH that are sometimes on the call, although I don't think they are today. But they've been sewing us masks also, and we're very, very grateful for every, every effort along those lines. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Gary. Okay, so I want to uh, speak to you again. It seems like my weekly topic about the economic stimulus funds because we get lots of questions, you know, go figure. Um, and today we're going to issue some clarify the roles and responsibilities of regional offices and rep payees in regard to those um, for people who receive SSDI benefits. SSA, Social Security Administration was just a conduit the IRS used to push out the stimulus payments to individuals who don't file um, income taxes. If you file income taxes, they're sending that stimulus check um, to whatever was on your last tax return. And, and in some cases, that's a provider address or a personal address. So for the folks who have rep payee, do not file taxes, um, it was pushed through the Social Security Administration, and they've given us guidance that these are not considered SSDI benefits, um, of course, so they're not going to be auditing, auditing those and monitoring those like they would the benefits. So it's up to the rep payee um, to be responsible for those funds. So for the regional offices, the guidance we're giving them is um, they're, they're putting the money into a separate sub-account, holding it separate for the needs of the consumer. But if, they have, if the individual has a guardian, that guardian has the same rights or responsibilities to that funding um, as they would other non-SSDI benefits. So in some cases, the guardians um, may be having some uses for that fund. So we're sending that guidance out. And as far as the providers who are in possession of those um, of that funds, we're applying the same um, the same rules that we have now for non-SSDI benefits. If the provider's in possession of it, the regional office will will add it to their review. If it's in the person's um, plan, that they cannot manage their own funds. So right now, for individuals who have personal funds managed by the provider, the regional office will review it if it's in the plan that the person can't manage their own funds. So that'd be the only, the only time the regional office will be reviewing those. So if you have any other questions about that, send them in. Um, we're going to be writing this up and putting it on the website today. So it is my privilege to get to read two um, frontline hero stories. The first one is I'm going to use initials. DW works in St. Louis. And she's played a major role in supporting the supervisors and directors where she worked. She spent countless hours shopping for food supplies and even created a pantry for ISLs they support. She's also had to maintain her caseload along with transitions of new clients into ISL. She never complained and always made herself available to assist others. She's handled the stress of this difficult time with grace and we're proud to have her on a team. And then there's ER, who also works in St. Louis, and he's been very helpful in monitoring staffing patterns to keep consistent staff in certain homes. He's also been very helpful with the screening process and make sure that it's gone smoothly. So thank you, ER, and thank you to the folks who sent the stories in. And with that, I will turn it over to Angie. Hey, good morning, everyone. Um, seems like I get the exciting topics, no health net. So. Um, today we're going to talk a little bit about MoHealthNet reinvestigations and hopefully it'll clear up some, some confusion. Um, the Family Support Division has waived all of the annual reviews, which you know, we call reinvestigations, um, for MoHealthNet, our Medicaid cases, under the Families First Coronavirus Response Act. And that is in effect from April 1st, 2020 through December 31st, 2020. Those annual review dates will be extended 12 months for cases with annual reviews coming due during this time period. So what that means is that an annual review that would have been due on, let's say, June 1st, 2020, will now be due on June 1st, 2021. 
and a review that would have been due on December 1st, 2020 will now be due on December 1st, 2021. So you do not have to submit annual reviews and this should not have any impact on a client's coverage. Any changes should still re be reported within 10 days though, and that just means that Family Support Division will not review the cases due um, that are supposed to be reviewed this year. So continue to send those questions in. We have great Medicaid eligibility specialists in our office and specific website on the BMH um, webpage. So I think I've shared that before and we can, we can make sure to continue sharing that information. There is um, another question that's come up about billing um, for time when an individual is not in the car. So we've, we've heard some broad questions about whether or not a provider can bill in order to provide an individual food and personal necessities, even though they may not be in the car with them due to the, the COVID risk mitigation. The questions are pretty broad, so I'm gonna cover a few different options here. Um, depending on what your situation is. So it really depends on the service that the person is receiving. So for example, state plan personal care services, that already allows for the direct support professional to do essential tasks such as grocery shopping, um, going to the store for personal items without the individual present. So if, if an individual is eligible and they're authorized to receive those state plan personal care services, then you can continue to use um, that service in the manner of of going to the store and shopping without the person with them. If those questions are referring to waiver residential or waiver personal care services, the direct support professional could do the shopping without the individual present during this emergency period based on the individual's needs and making sure that that documentation is um, included because um, we want to make sure that that's um, in there to avoid any potential audit findings. So just make sure that it says it's required um, during the COVID emergency because of the individual's needs. It is not generally allowable for a provider to bill mileage in situations where the individual is not present with them. So um, hopefully that helps clear up. If there are specific situations that you have questions about, feel free to continue to send me those questions in and we can try to help work through those. I was hoping to have an Appendix K update of good news, but I have not heard anything yet. We've had a few questions back and forth with CMS this week and we believe that we're on our final review and hope to hear um, something from them today or early next week about an approval. So fingers crossed everyone that we get that one wrapped up. And then for me, I've got a few frontline hero stories to share. So it's really exciting to be able to share these. Um, Angela works in Potosi and she had an individual that was upset and thinking that no one was going to remember her birthday a staff member that really wasn't working at that time due to the doctor's orders organized um, gathering items and had them delivered to her porch for her birthday. And her grandma stated that this really made her birthday special. So thank you for not forgetting those special days. They really do mean a lot to, to each and every person. Um, Dorsal works in St. Charles and Dorsal stepped up to the plate and assisted with packaging and distribu distributing masks for staff. Um, so thank you very much, Dorsal, for, for stepping in and, and doing that as well. I know that the masks are really important in a time like this, and it's just great to see how everyone has pitched in in making them and distributing them um, to, I mean, all across the state. So those are my updates for today, and I will pass it along to Kim. Thanks, Angie. Good morning, everybody. I just have the pleasure of kind of expanding and sharing some a few things to consider. Val really did a great job on speaking to where we're all at right now with making those decisions on an individualized basis. Um, just as a reminder, everybody is aware we've entered into phase one of the Show Me Strong Recovery Plan. And so with that, we're all having to make those important individualized decisions right now. And just as a reminder, there is a lot of information and guidance out there from both CDC and the Department of Health and Senior Services. Um, we actually have on our website here that HICA has pulled up down at the bottom, um, in case you're not aware, quick links that will take you to those very important resources and the DHSS link takes you specifically to um, information related to COVID. And there's some really great information out there. DHSS posts around two o'clock every day, updates in regards to the activity of cases based upon counties and that can really help you as you're making some of those important individualized decisions. And also, I um, just want to remind everyone it's really important right now to be, you know, having that ongoing communication with your healthcare providers. They can be a really great resource to you 
when you're having to make some of those important decisions on what makes the most sense for you and your family members and, and who you're living with. I um, want to stress that, you know, everybody needs to be making those important decisions. You need to be informed. Um, everyone's unique. And so making those decisions is going to be different for each person. So please, you know, keep that in mind. Um, when you're thinking about some of those kind of multifactorial things, when you're thinking about your own personal plan and the decisions that you're making during phase one, um, things to think about is, you know, what's happening right now regarding current COVID-19 cases in my community? And again, that's where that information from DHSS can be vitally important because right now, different counties in the state are seeing different levels of COVID-19 activity. So it's really important for you to be educated and informed on that information. Some other important things to consider is, you know, are you at risk? Am I at risk for severe illness from COVID-19? Are individuals that I live with at um, a high risk for severe illness from COVID-19? And so again, CDC has put out a lot of great information and tools and guidance around um, some of those important things to take into consideration. And again, communicating with your healthcare provider is gonna be a great resource for you as well. So I can't emphasize enough um, right now, it's what is the best plan for me and for my family and who I live with. And it's gonna vary from individual, um, from person to person. So with that, I think I'm gonna go on to share a really cool story that was posted. And I think it's really awesome, as Val mentioned, that we have the opportunity to have everybody submitting in the stories from the field and submitting the frontline hero stories. And when you think about, you know, as Missourians right now, we've entered into this first phase of, of the Show Me Strong. I think these are really good examples of how we, we are Show Me Strong. Um, and so this particular example is um, from Jamie. And Jamie um, supports individuals who receive ISL services in Columbia. And whoever submitted the story shared that for the past few weeks, um, this particular agency and, and team members and staff had made some important decisions. And a lot of the agencies across the state have done this where have adjusted schedules and really kind of um, moving in with individuals to provide that continued support to decrease the amount of risk of exposure for individuals. And, and that's a huge commitment. And Jamie actually volunteered to do this for two weeks. So thank you again for, you know, making those decisions and supporting individuals. Um, in addition to that, she also, um, this is really so touching, um, she, one of the individuals had to be hospitalized and it was during Jamie's off week where she wasn't scheduled to go in and provide support. Um, whoever submitted this said that she came running to the rescue and she stayed with the, um, and she stayed with them for four days in the hospital. And they said that they feel that they are so blessed to have Jamie on their team. And so thank you, Jamie, and thank you to everybody out there who who's have all these wonderful stories of what you're doing to support everyone. So at that, with that, I'll turn it over um, to Wendy to share some information. Good morning, everybody. Um, last week we posted, or Val posted, uh, guidance about reopening service delivery. And along with that came an appendix that we posted in draft form. That's what we talked about it a little bit last week saying we really want feedback from you all about things that we haven't considered in here, things that need to be included as well. And so please send us your feedback on this draft form about guidance for reopening home and community-based service delivery system. Um, the first, it kind of covers different areas. There's some attachments or some um, links actually to some federal guidance, but we tried to Missouriize this as best we could. And in the first, um, several boxes where we've got boxes there. They're really um, business considerations that you need to think about in reopening your business and, and determining your capacity and what your sustainability is and those types of things. And then there um, past that are a bunch of considerations for programming ideas and issues and then just some general, dis um, general considerations, personnel, protective equipment, things you need to consider about and consider and workforce availability and support. So a lot of those two are things that we are also considering as we're evaluating how to reopen regional offices. And so looking at the county that you're in and also considering the surrounding counties, uh, depending on how close you are to the border and where your staff come from. If you've got staff that come from other counties that might be having a higher incidence of um, COVID than the county you're in, you need to consider that in terms of them coming back to work and how to organize that. Likewise, with the people that you serve, what counties do they come 
from um, are they currently living in as well as their personal um, needs that, that both Val and Kim have talked to and, and how to assess their, their particular needs and coming back. So I won't get into that again, but if you could take some time and look at that draft guidance and give us your feedback on that, that would be helpful and then we'll work to make that um, um, final, um, as final as anything can be, I guess, in this environment. We also had um, several folks that provide day services and employment services that are interested in talking more about and continuing telehealth services like what they're able to do now. So we have arranged two webinars to invite people who are providing those services currently to join with us and just have a conversation about what's working well, what, what's not working well, and to help us problem solve some things through that, like how do we ensure um, the validity of those ser services, like with EVV when you're going to a place EVV is a process to assure that, yep, they showed up, they were there, and we hope that the service was delivered while they were there. But um, if, if it is a telehealth service, how do we go about verifying that? How do we have assurances um, that those things are covered? So please be thinking about those things and how we can work through some of those details, because those are going to be questions that come up. So on May 14th is the first webinar and that is for day services. So in that we're including day hab, community integration, individual skill development, and personal assistant services. So if you provide any of those services, want to talk about telehealth and help us brainstorm some things around that, please join us on that webinar. It's from 1230 to 2 and we will be sending out um, information on that and registrations for that. And then on May 18th from 10 to 11.30 will be um, the webinar that will talk with employment providers and have that conversation with them. So hoping that you all can join us because we need your help in sorting through some of the details and things that we need to consider. Um, we also posted guidance that we've gotten some questions around, around the individualized um, service planning for reentry into the community and day services and employment. And so the questions were kind of around the addendums and how the, it, we say that the, the checklist that is attached there is optional, yet it sounds like in the letter that it's, it's required. The checklist itself is not required. It is an optional tool for you to step through the considerations that you need to take into account as you're planning for people's individual circumstance when they're re-entering the community or going back to day program or employment or whatever that service is. What isn't optional in the plan is that you have to account for those mitigating those risks and speak to those protocols in the plan. So you don't have to use the checklist and attach it to the plan, but you need, do need to consider the content of what's in, in that checklist and make sure that you're addressing it in the plan so that everybody's prepared for when they do return to the community. So I hope that that helps clarify um, some things. It's not a new process, it's not a new addendum process, it is just bringing attention and focus to those specific healthcare concerns around COVID-19 and how we do that. So I'm hope, I hope that that is um, helpful. Also in that, as you're, um, you're wrestling with some of those decisions about when to reopen and when to re-engage in the community and do those things. We've got some folks that are really struggling with work. Um, our folks that are employed and have supported employment jobs and how you balance as a provider, whether when they go back to work, whether it be a competitive job or into the sheltered workshop. And you have to um, balance some um, individual rights along with your responsibilities as a provider about how to protect um, people in certain circumstances. So if, if it's a situation, for example, that um, they're living in, in a setting with other roommates that it's just not safe for the other roommates, it's felt that if one roommate goes out and goes to work, then, then maybe you're looking at different kinds of living arrangements. If, it, if, if that roommate and that family and that team is really um, bent on um, that person going back to work and needing to re-engage there is, is there other ways to problem solve around that? Is there different living arrangements that they could have so that, that the folks that are in the home are still protected? So just, again, throwing that out there for consideration, it's all going to be very individualized. There's no right or wrong way to go about this. It is, it is just going to be real, some really 
um, gut-wrenching and difficult decisions and conversations to have with teams and folks. And so then the last thing that I wanted to touch on today that we're getting questions around is some confusion around plan, plan amendments and the use of um, the expedited UR. And I think through going through some of these questions, we've identified where we can probably add some clarity to some of the guidance, so look for that to come out. But the expedited UR process is designed to help people transition into that new emergency situation. So if it was a, a change in a residential setting that they were in or it was transitioning from day program that, or employment back to the residential service so we could get that, um, that service transitioned and the billing, the providers able to bill for that service as quickly as possible. As you transition away from that temporary situation back, um, it will depend upon, you know, what the situation is. So if you're, if you're transitioning from your temporary residential situation back to your permanent home, you can use that expedited UR process again to move back to that, to that permanent home. So you're living at home with mom and dad, and now they're coming back to live in their ISL or in a group home. You can use that expedited process to, to move back. And that expedited UR form does serve as the addendum. So a separate addendum is not needed when you're using that expedited UR process. But when you are transitioning back from, you know, your residential setting maybe to a community activity, community integration, day program, employment, and you're, trans, you're transitioning back and re-entering the community settings, that's when you're going to need to really be looking at those individualized planning around those safety needs, that Appendix A that we were just talking about, and that needs to be included in the plan through an addendum process so that um, everybody has those considerations in mind and, and we're, we're sure that those things are being thought through and carefully considered as they re-enter. So that would follow the regular addendum process, but again, that's a little further down the road. You've got time to do that planning, time to do that assessment, check some things out, and to make that happen. So it's not an urgent um, needs to happen today, tomorrow kind of situation. So hopefully that answers some questions there. And if not, please keep your questions coming. It does help us to improve the guidance that we're putting out there. So we will make changes to guidance as we, as we um, sort through the questions and know that what we can improve there. So thank you for all your questions on that. Um, I have a couple stories that I want to share before I turn it back over to Val and we close out for the day. Um, Kelsey E. works in Springfield and Kelsey has gathered art supplies and led free art classes via Zoom for a group of amazing artists. So thank you, Kelsey, for continuing that um, excitement in that, in that work going forward and getting people involved in art and staying engaged. Mackenzie W. also works in Springfield and she has an individual that she serves that began a Wednesday morning workout group via Zoom. So we know that staying healthy is really critical to all of us, especially now. So thank you, Mackenzie, um, for um, your work and keeping your um, people connected and active and going. So with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Val to wrap things up. All right, we did have a couple questions come in on the Q&A, but they just kind of came in right now, so we'll work on getting those answers out. Um, before we end today, and again, thank you, we did have over 350 people on the call today. Our numbers were down a little today, but we also kind of expected that knowing that state employees have a holiday today. Um, so congratulations, it's Harry S. Truman's birthday. If you're looking for something to Google today, learn more about our Missouri president, right? Uh, but before I leave, let's talk a little bit, uh, just a little bit more. I want to remember it to, this is National Nurses Week, and nurses are a key, key component to the work that we do, um, both in the community supporting individuals, supporting providers, learning the information, educating, um, just everything that they do is really, really important. So don't forget to say thank you to your nurses this week. I'm sure you already have, but we're saying thank you now too. It's also Public Service Recognition Week, and so it's also a good time to remember most of us are in public service, and um, it, we're grateful for everybody who is willing to, to work in public service. Finally, May is Mental Health Awareness Month. Um, and we'll just leave on the note, don't forget self-care is very, very important. Um, it gets uh, pointed out to me all the time, I need to do more self-care, I need to do more self-care, it's hard to do. 
but we do need to, to make it a priority for ourselves and we do need to support each other. So keep doing what you're doing. Um, and I know those things are really important and have a good week and we'll talk again next week. Thanks.